Hello listeners, if you noticed that the title was a little bit clickbaity, I did that on purpose to try to attract more listeners to this episode today because this episode has been on my mind for quite a while now and as you can see I'm in this nice new area in my house that looks a little bit better than you know my room did at like 11 o'clock at night so and I'm gonna have way more like visuals in my video as long as with my um more like of myself in the video too to try to give you guys something you know more to look at than just was it called a um, screen with just the learn stem logo on it but anyways I wanted to basically make sure though that I did this episode it's justice because I'm really excited about this episode and I'll get to more what it is about in a little bit so um before I give you all like the background of the episode as I usually do um just do you guys remember that like one Q&A session that we did a while back where we talked about our weird you know hobbies or jobs that we wanted to do so basically I kind of forgot about like this weird trifold of jobs and occupations I've thought about basically my entire life, and I still do. So basically, the three kind of occupations that I want, they're, it's a kind of a weird variety, and it's a wide-ranging variety. Like, they're not super similar, but in this episode, I will tie all three of them together. And those three occupations are just physics, linguistics, and archaeology, because, you know, those are all three pretty cool op- occupations. And... I said just, as in, like, just three, because I used to have, like, thousands. Like, not thousands, but obviously that's hyperbole. But I had way more than that, so I've narrowed it down to just three. So those will all be present in this video. And so basically, this episode incorporates all three of them in pretty interesting ways than what would normally be. So, for example, um, this episode is going to be about absolute dating techniques. um, Carbon-14 dating, um, potassium-40 dating. Um, relative dating, absolute dating, cool archaeology finds, and a linguistical study that was conducted on an archaeological, um, like, kind of piece or relic, whatever you want to call it. And that thing is really fun to dive into and, you know, kind of dissect. So that is what we're going to do. My brother's bird had a fit after that. So without any, so that's why I, like, cut it really weirdly. But without any further ado, let's get learning. Okay, so I'm going to be including quite a bit of pictures in this video today. So if you're just listening to the podcast episode, and just I'll play this little camera shutter sound. And once you hear that sound, um, just make sure to like unlock your phone, click see the picture so you don't miss anything, you know, detailed. Because because this has a little bit of linguistics in it, it well not that much, but has a little bit of you know looking at different alphabets in it. So you might want to look at that in order to have like better comprehension than just me talking about what a language looks like. So yeah, now onto the actual background. Okay, so archaeology. It's basically in today's society seen as an occupation that is becoming more and more obsolete. And I kind of do agree with that to a certain extent because, you know, most of the stuff probably will have already been found, you know, and except however it will continue to be a crucial part of science um basically forever you know why is that um well so basically it's examination of history through um non-living records such as fossils artifacts you know in the use of dig sites etc to uncover you know the facts of history and infer upon the missing facts of history and yeah i'm just like having a little bit kind of a script you know just so i don't sound too all over the place so yeah that's why i'll be looking off but anyways um, yeah, so now why I do agree that there's less, less to discover than before, individuals, you know, can still reanalyze history. You can still obviously find new parts of history that has not been covered before because, you know, our world is just so big. And, I've, and in the ocean, it has been, you know, stated that a bunch of artifacts have been gone, mis- have gone missing in the ocean. And, you know, that is still a big place to uncover things. But basically, you can come to new conclusions on stuff that has already been deemed, you know, unbreakable, undecipherable, all that kind of stuff. So there is more to discover, and we'll be talking about a text on that later. So something, that is something that a lot of people do not think the 
archaeologist you know can do because when something's already found you most likely already know the purpose of the object and you most likely already know you know what was the context behind an object but that is actually a myth you know archaeologists still uncover new facts even for like um, stuff that has been found, you know, long time. This is especially true when new objects are found and they give insight into old objects that were seen prior, but they were not fully understood. This is a prime example of that, and this is the Rosetta Stone. Prior to this, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics were often just construed as something that cannot be deciphered, and it was often just viewed as something that, you know, was impossible to break through. But this Rosetta Stone was in three different languages. It was in hieroglyph hieroglyphics, it was in Greek, and it was in like the native spoken language of the Egyptians at the time. So because it was in these three different languages, it actually allowed, you know, these ling linguists and um, Egyptologists to decipher what hieroglyphics actually meant, and it gave them the opportunity to look at previous discovered artifacts that had hieroglyphics on it and actually tell and decipher what they actually meant. So this is just a prime example of that, you know, you don't need to give up to decipher something. Another thing that an archaeologist might be misconstrued of is that they're just a humanity subject and that is just simply not the case because an archaeologist, in order to become an archaeologist, you must be proficient in multiple disciplines. Like for example, if you were an archaeologist that specialized in historical linguistics, not only would you, you know, be proficient in linguistic linguistics, the study of languages, you would also, you must be proficient in, you know, like, you must know history, you know, and if you were, if you were um, an archaeologist that also, you know, you know, had some dabbling in atomical physics, you know, you might just do a lot of carbon dating, you might do a lot of relative absolute dating, you know, all of those types of things that archaeologists, you know, must be proficient in, in order to have a good understanding of what they're studying. Adding on, an archaeologist must be proficient in at least one language, of course, but other languages they often need to be proficient in too. For example, I'm a native English speaker and I could not understand Old English and certainly maybe not even Middle English. So, and that would especially be the case if I'm studying, you know, a very foreign language and I'm not even base proficiency level in that, I would definitely need to pick up more proficiency in the language in order to continue with my study. Now, before I show you all an example of what I'm talking about, um, just to let you know, I am definitely not an expert on the Hebrew language, and I still barely know a single thing, but I am trying to learn Hebrew, so I'm going to try to teach you guys a tiny bit of what I've learned so far, and which kind of sinks in the point that I was trying to make, but keep in mind, my pronunciation is still terrible. I don't know that much at all, so be, you've been warned. So, for example, from what I've learned so far, a biblical archaeologist in the Middle East would need to know that in Hebrew the word nora means terrible in Ivrit Hadasha or New Hebrew slash Modern Hebrew. However, in Biblical Hebrew, or Ivrit Mikraid, it means something like fearfully in awe in reference to God. Hopefully that was not too bad, but as you can see, the word literally changes meaning 180 degrees, which is pretty crazy actually. And further now in from what I know, in modern Hebrew it is it can be used about anything. While well, in biblical Hebrew it was not the case thousands of years ago. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to not be able to have video for the rest of the episode because my room is a mess and I cannot do it downstairs because my family is moving around and making some noise. And outside I tried going outside, but our neighbors are having their land cleared right now, so that's even more of a hassle and my room's kind of messy. So I'm just going to do a voiceover, except I will still continue to have, you know, the little camera shutter to provide you with context for when I'm gonna show you a picture. Anyways though, throughout the era of humanity, we have looked at the past and wanted to basically know what actually went on. Contrarily though, that was mainly through written primary and secondary accounts through most of human history, and the study of archaeology actually started in the 15th to 16th centuries, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, when the re re Renaissance movement encouraged a revival of the classical Greek and Roman time period. Concurrently with the true start of archaeology, this is also most notably the start of the rapid development of the sciences and humanities into, eventually, the Industrial Revolution. In short, this meant that archaeological discovery was hastened faster and faster due to technological advancement which has culminated into a few hundred years of mass intellectual betterment. Today, this means that we have found so much of what we can find as 97% of human history is lost. But we are still developing those better techniques to learn even more information, develop even more context, and infer upon that history that was lost. 
This leads me now to the second portion of this episode about the techniques of absolute and relative dating. Okay, primarily relative dating. This type of dating is most likely what someone with no knowledge on how to conduct carbon dating would use. It is basically just using known points of time around the object you are studying to approximate how old the fossil, book, figure, and more is. It is the use of relationships tied around the object to develop points of context for a new find. Think of the mental map of relationships and relatives to, you know, you know, remember relative dating because they coincide with each other. Okay, to help you kind of like put yourself in like the moment of what an archaeologist, you know, would do when they find a fossil, here is something that I put together. Okay, so basically you just imagine that you're an archaeologist and you're just looking around and you saw a trilobite fossil, even though that's totally not a trilobite fossil. So basically, um, um, you just found a trilobite. You are like, whoa, cool, but how old is this? I do not know. You know, I don't know how to absolute date things. What am I supposed to do? So you're like, oh, wait, I can rel relative date it, you know? So here are some options you can do. A, you can look up how old other trilobites were in the same conditions, same areas, etc. B, you can... It, um, where If you look where you dug up the specimen, you can most likely determine how deep the fossil was in the soil and get a rough estimate that way. In my scenario, since it would be just on the ground, it, is obviously, it has obviously just died or has just been dug up and put there, so we know that it's just been either tampered with recently or it just died recently. And finally, C, if you found it in a historically significant site, you could put it in relation to cities near the dig site or in the dig site you found it on. So, obviously, this form of, like, relative dating is certainly not the most precise, but it is useful in certain moments, or for getting a quick idea of how old a certain archaeological object might be. Relative dating is basically a form of dating that anyone could use, but, of course, experienced archaeologists would be the most precise with it. So, to now go into the actual physics -y part of archaeology, absolute dating. Specifically, absolute dating is mostly just another term for radiometric dating. This is th the examination of the present parts per million of an isotope left in something. For organic, living organisms, we acquire new isotopes every day in our body. As we move, breathe in and out air, touch the world around us, feel the wind on our face, drink water, etc., etc., we are constantly being exposed to isotopes, no matter how small in molar mass or, or volume. But when living organisms die, they do not usually take in any more of these isotopes. This means that in preserved specimens that are not being exposed to the living world, they slowly lose the amount of isotope that they have left as it decays along its constant and predictable half-life. This is where carbon-14 comes in. It is present in high enough concentrations throughout the world so that it is seen in every arch archaeological finding. And with a half-life of 5,730 years, scientists can trace the amount of carbon-14 that is left in the material slash object to the original average amount. Pretty smart, huh? Further, they do not just make up this average number that a species might have originally had, but they actually conduct tests by cutting trees and coral, which can each be determined how old it is by the growth, growth rate of its rings. For example, you know, tree rings, it grows basically a certain amount each year, and the amount that it grows shows basically how productive it was that year, so they can get a pretty good average for how old a tree might be. Um, and... Basically, recently, this has said this has led to numerous realizations in which they did that tree and coral, you know, study, in which previous estimates of how old objects have been are actually incorrect and are believed to be around 1,000 years younger on average, according to Nicola Jones, a scientific journalist summarizing new research in the archaeological field. But for non-organic substances that do not breathe in carbon-14, like rocks, scientists have actually found potassium-40 to test for in rocks. Not only is this isotope actually present in geology, but it has a way longer half-life than carbon-14 does. I'll let you guess, and I'll give you a couple seconds to guess how long the half-life of potassium-40 is. Okay, um, say your answer is down in the comments below, but it's 
not even 10,000, not 100,000, not 1 million. Nope, it's actually 1.25 billion years is its half-life. Now, that is an insanely long time. Carbon-14 dating would be incredibly useless at that point because there would actually be nothing left. Potassium-40, on the other hand, because it lasts so much longer, is way more useful for geological dating because it allows scientists to determine how old rocks are actually. Not just, you know, give very egregious estimates by using carbon-14 dating because it would basically just be guessing at that point, and you might as well just use relative dating. Now, I have named to you the numerous upsides of absolute dating, but let's be clear. It is incredibly complicated once you take into account that these artifacts are not in controlled scientific environments. For instance, one artifact that I have been absolutely been obsessed with is the Shroud of Turin. This shroud is both believed to be a relic of Jesus by some, but is also believed to be a fake by others. The story goes is that the Shroud of Turin was the cloth that wrapped Jesus' body right after he was crucified and in his burial for three days after his death before he rose again. As you can see on the screen, when the first negative photo of this cloth was seen, you could clearly see a man that was being buried with lacerations on his hands and feet who, who sustained terrible beatings, a lens to the heart, etc. This is characteristically the fate that Jesus went through in the Bible, which has made it accredited by, ben by many as being real. It was then carbon-14 dated, and it came back as being made in the 13th century. However, this is disputed because in the 13th century, this same relic was in a burning building where it was kept, so some new cloth was added to the burned, you know, pieces. This fact alone made many say that the tested cloth por portion was that of the replaced cloth. Further, a study was conducted to try and mimic the blood patterns, pattern, pattern, sorry, of an individual wrapped in a cloth of the same dimensions facing down. However, it was concluded as being, quote, unclear if its findings to see if it was possible. Again, many, dis many say that the transportation of the body being placed in the shroud, then transported, could account for these irregu irregularities, but the study determined that it was pretty much very difficult for this cloth to have the bloodstream patterns as it was seen on the cloth. But most interestingly, a study was conducted by physicist pa Paolo di Lazzaro to try and recreate the imprinting of an image of a man in the cloth. The study, even after trying old and new ways of tech to try and forge a re recreation of the piece, it failed. For many, this solidified the Shroud of Turin to become a true relic, seeing as it had the eff essence of God's image on the Shroud. Whatever the case, it is a fascinating and it is a testament, sorry that was a bad joke, to how carbon-14 dating can be useful, but it does not always give 100% security surrounding an artifact. Now to the artifact that has still not been cracked. Or has it? This might have been obvious to some of you, but for the others, I am talking about the Voynich Manuscripts. As you can see, there will be a lot of pictures accompanying the Voynich Manuscript, so... As you can see in the video, these manuscripts are weird. Like, really weird. They feature incredibly strange flowers, exposed humans bathing in green water, astrological and astronomical charts, and a ton of other little strange occurrences you can see in the video. The most crazy part though is actually not the imagery, even though it admittedly is very creepy, but is actually the language. It seems to be a scramble of Latin letters, Arabic numbers, and unknown characters. And it is a, it is a Semitic language, so basically it could be based in Hebrew, Arabic, or Aramaic. While I was looking at the Voynich manuscripts, though, I was immediately thinking that it looked like a mix of Arabic, Hebrew, and Georgian. I'll show you examples of each on the screen now. For the Arabic alphabet, in the top left of the screen, you see a letter that matches the Arabic alphabet almost perfectly. For the middle of the, you know, circled green letters on the screen, you can see that it looks like that alphabet that letter that matches the Arabic alphabet perfectly, but it looks like it's flipped over the y-axis if you're viewing this on, let's say, a math graph. And then finally, there seems to be a letter 8 in the Voynich manuscript, which kind of looks like an Arabic letter that looks like a sideways 8, but it's flipped upwards. For the Hebrew alphabet, the chait basically looks the same, but there's more curls and twists, except that might just be the author's handwriting, because it does make it look nicer, I have to say, but for the Samech, it basically looks the same, 
it yeah basically just looks the same and it's basically an easy tell but that could also be you know a latin character for all i know now onto the georgian alphabet i have no idea what this alphabet actually entails be because i'm definitely not anywhere well versed in the alphabet but Basically, when I was doing my research for, you know, the different languages that kind of looks like the Voynich Manuscript, I came upon this one, and it has so many curls, so many, like, circles, so many, just basically it looks very cursive -y. So, you can see the green circled um, letter in the Georgian alphabet, and it kind of relates to one of the Voynich characters seen on the screen, because it looks like three C's in a row, which looks like the character that I circled, but obviously you can tell the similarities and differences. But after my masterful explanation of what the Voynich characters look like, I'm, I, I'm sure you're surprised that I didn't crack it myself, but apparently the code has been cracked for the Voynich manuscript. But don't get worried, because it's going to take a couple of years before it gets, you know, fully translated, so you can probably take a stab at it yourself. But before reading which language it was, you know, I was actually dead set that it was like kind of a it looked like Georgian because it seemed to have be written from left to right. It had a cursive style font, and it had those curly letters associated with the Georgian alphabet. Let me know what you guys thought it was, but according to the art newspaper, a news story detailed how German Egyptologist Rainer Hennig from the Romer and Pelizaeus Museum in Hildensheim, Germany, said that the language was actually based in Hebrew. He was apparently able to start the translation process for the Voynich manuscript, and it should be fully translated in a couple of years from now, as I stated prior. At first, I was like, that does not look like Hebrew, but then I saw the similarities between some cursive letters in Hebrew and print letters, but I'm still not sure how it is written right to left, because the leftmost letter on almost all the pages is bigger, indicating a starting point. And so basically, if you want to know what I'm trying to say here, if, like, just think of an example, like, from the Shrek book. You know how, like, on all the stories in, like, children's books, the first letter that is on the leftmost side is, like, capitalized to show the start of the story? It's basically the same for the Voynich manuscript, so I'm surprised it's actually not written left to right, but it's written right to left. So, I'm not sure about you all, but I cannot wait for it to be fully translated, because it has six major s sections, which apparently include botanical, astronomical and astrological, biological, cosmological, and pharmaceutical, and then lastly, recipes. This text was first made a big deal in like 1912, I think, but it was carbon dated to been, have been made around the 15th, 16th century CE. It turns out that this was actually a high precision and correct answer due to carbon dating, because there were records if this, that this book was made by Roger Bacon, though the author is not completely certain at all, and it belonged to Emperor Rudolf II of Germany, um, which he was a Holy Roman Emperor from 1576 to 1612. So this strange showcase of Semitic language is actually an example of how carbon dating can be very useful in collaboration with other identifying information to get a highly accurate time period. Just to let you know, I'm sorry for the late upload, and this is kind of like I've already finished talking about everything, this is kind of the conclusion. But so basically, it didn't let me add any more to like the iMovie that I'm doing in yesterday, so I had to like finish it today, so that's why it has a late upload, but I'm now able to get my video back now, so that's kind of a plus, but this is just the last portion. But anyways, I basically want to say that that is all I had today. I hope you all learned something fun today, and I hope you had fun learning today, and as I said in the beginning, if you enjoyed it, let me know. If my Hebrew was bad, let me know in the comments so I can improve it. If you have tips and tricks, please let me know, and if there's anything else you want to let me know, just put it in the comment section down below. And um, yeah, thank you. If you like this episode and you want to learn more and get more episodes like this, listen to Ryan, Nisa, Milani, and me. We have tons of other episodes you can go listen to, vlogs, interviews, etc. But um, we, we publish our episodes on Spotify, Anchor, YouTube, Apple Music, Apple Pod... Not Apple Music, Apple Podcasts. But yeah. Um, I really enjoy... Yeah. Basically, I really enjoyed making these episodes in the theory series, so... Hopefully you all like them, and I'll continue to make them. Yeah. Bye, and stay safe, and keep on learning.
For a quick side note, the reason why I decided to put carbon dating in the theory series is because I just realized I did not explain why it's like in the theory series. It's because even though carbon dating in a controlled and scientific environment would yield 100% correct results if we knew the base amount of carbon-14, there isn't something. The thing is, we don't always know the base amount of carbon-14, there isn't something. Like, for example, like thousands of years ago, we don't for sure know how much carbon-14 there was in the air compared to now. It could be the same, it could be different. So because of all these outside variables that are inside carbon dating, that's why I decided to put it kind of on the theory series list because it's a best guess of how old something is and it's not 100% correct even though it can yield pretty close results. So thank you and keep on learning, especially learning by LearnSTEM.